Okay, uh, this uh, lecture and uh, PowerPoint uh, presentation uh, is called How Business Can Change the World, an exercise in strategic foresight and vision. It's based on the book Capitalism at the Crossroads by Stuart Hart. Now, you might wonder, well, how can business change the world? Because it seems like, I mean, you know, oftentimes you, you, you people think that maybe business is part of the problem, you know, with a lot of the world problems today are related to the, the way that uh, people do business. But uh, the, the, the answer lies in the, uh, the, the passage here that says from Marcel Proust, the real, discover, the real voyage in discovery is not seeking new lands, but seeing with new eyes. So what that means is that the way we do business is it, it, we, it, we have to change our thinking about the way we do business and we have to be able to see with new eyes. Now I'm going to ex explain that more as I go along. So first of all, um, the, the overview is that uh, the first thing that uh, I want to talk about is how corporations can realize global sustainable development, how it's possible. Uh, theoretically speaking. And uh, then we'll go through sort of the history of uh, the traditional business as usual industry paradigm and the command and control re regulation response. And then the uh, greening revolution that shatters the trade-off myth, product stewardship and green design protocols, and then beyond greening towards sustainability. Uh, and then indigenous enterprise, the new sustainability, sustainability challenge, and then finally achieving global sustainable development. Now, first of all, uh, the capacity of corporations to realize global sustainability. Uh, if you think about it, corporations are the only entities that have the technology, the resources, the capacity, and the global reach to be able to realize global sustainability. Even more than any one country, corporations have this kind of capability. So uh, what it comes down is to that the profit motive too. It doesn't mean that uh, achieving global sustainability necessarily has to uh, you know, take away from uh, the profit motive, but the profit motive can, can actually accelerate, not inhibit, the transformation towards global sustainability. And uh, this can be done through, uh, for example, NGOs, governments, uh, multilateral agencies, and uh, internet forums can also play crucial roles as collaborators and watchdogs. Take a look at how that's possible. Okay, for example, if we look at the, tradi the traditional sort of business as usual industry paradigm that has basically about a 200 year you know, organizational paradigm. And then what has been the command and control response? First of all, industries rely upon the extraction of the cheapest raw materials. And it's also a race to the bottom for the cheapest factory labor. I don't know if you heard that expression before, race to the bottom. But it, what it means is that when all things being equal, you know, economically speaking, you know, in terms of competition between corporations, oftentimes the only real advantage that the corporation might have is that it is able to get labor for the cheapest possible price. So that's why I call it a race to the bottom. But of course, this is not ideal because it leads to, a, a, for example, a lot of human rights uh, uh, problems, to say the least. So, uh, and exploitation. So, and then also, the production of mass quantities of waste and pollution are just written off as mere you know, externalities of doing business, you know, that's, that's business, that's all, you know. And uh, so this is, this is kind of the paradigm that has been for the last 200 years. Of course, there's a lot of problems with this paradigm. And, and the response traditionally has been what's called command and control, that we have to command and control this uh, process. And then, and of course, what that means is there is a trade-off. But as I want to show you, this, this trade-off really is kind of an illusion. Like, for example, uh, this, in order to you know, respond to uh, this with, to this uh, problem of the, the take, make, and waste uh, paradigm, firms are told that they have to sacrifice their financial performance to meet social regulations. And so, and that also, this, this, what this means is there's going to be a massive wall of environmental and social regulation. 
And then also that there will be specific treatment technologies will be prescribed without regard for efficiency or cost effectiveness. This has been what the typical response has been in the past. In fact, in terms of externalities, just as a side note, and I mention that because corporations often think of like when, uh, they, when you know, uh, environmental or, or, or health problems or, or, or social problems or, uh, you know, uh, or come about as a consequence of, of the way that they do business, then they say oftentimes, oh, well, that's just externalities. We don't have to, we, that's not our problem. That, that, that's our, our problem, of course, is often in the, in the past. I said our, our only imperative is to make money. You know, we're profit driven. You know, we have to, uh, we, we chase the bottom line. But so anything else, it's just an externality. This is Milton Friedman, in fact, is one of the, you know, the Nobel Prize winning economists. He said that social and environmental issues are negatives for business. This is the way he looked at it. He said this is, such concerns should never be the part of a company's core activities. And the, the, the company's uh, only real uh, responsibility is, is to maximize profits. And uh, environmental, uh, social concerns, that, that just reduces profits, you know. Well, that was his, his thinking, I'm saying. Now I'm gonna, I'm gonna address that as I go along, uh, why I think that his, his approach is, is, is wrong and uh, it, needs to, it needs to be a completely different way of looking at things to see, see with new eyes. But first of all, let me give you an example what it means to see with new eyes. And when you have the same problem, but the way that you look at it, the way you approach it, uh, could be completely different. There's two scenarios, but the way of looking at it is completely different, and you can see what a big difference it'll make. For example, okay, let's say, a general, as a general manager of a company, you're confronted by Environmental Health and Safety Manager, the EHS, and the Public Affairs Director too. They come to you with this urgent problem. Well, what immediately comes to your mind? Problem, crisis, spill, incident, accident, boycott, protest, lawsuit, fine, jail time. And so when you look at it that way as a problem, rather than, you know, as a threat, rather than an opportunity, then this is your reaction, and what do you do? You run for the back door to flee, which is what a lot of corporations do oftentimes when they have these sort of environmental problems. Rather than face it, they just move from one country and just move to another country and start all over again. But let's say that the same, same you know, kind of thing happens, but instead, as general manager of this company, Instead of being approached by the environmental health and safety manager, the heads of marketing approaches you and says, there's a new product development anxious to meet with you. So it's a completely reframing it. Rather than seeing it as a problem, as a threat, they see this as a new opportunity. Of course, it means that you know, they have to change the way you do business. But that doesn't mean that you can't continue to do business or that you can't you know, profit. Uh, in the future, or even make more profits. So what immediately, but if you're approached with it this way, uh, seeing it from a different perspective, then what immediately comes to mind is breakthrough, opportunity, blockbuster, innovation, growth. And what do you do? In this case, you do the opposite. You run to the front office and let them in and greet them. So you have two uh, scenarios, but it is the same thing, really, but it's just completely two different ways of looking at it. And that's why I said you have to see with new eyes. If you just see a problem, then you know, then you all you'll you know, you'll you'll be you won't be able to uh, find a solution. But instead, if you look at it as an opportunity, so your reaction depends on how you perceive the situation. Learn to see with new eyes. So uh, at one point, the uh, the greening revolution occurred like around in the 60s, uh, and it began to shatter this sort of trade-off myth. That's why I said this whole trade-off uh, response to the uh, take, make, and waste paradigm was really uh, an illusion. And the greening revolution brought that out through, for example, 
quality process control management, where quality is built in. You know, it becomes part of the design and production process. It's not something that you try to bring in after the fact. But, so rather than inspect it in, you know, due to inspections, we have to bring in more quality. It's built in from the very design itself. It's built-in capacity for continuous improvement, too, into the management system by empowering the workers to improve their work process, you know, continually, rather than just blindly following prescribed procedures. So, continuous improvement. And preventing pollution and other negative impacts actually turns out to be, in the long run, cheaper and more effective than cleaning up and dealing with the mess afterwards. So you have this total quality environmental management protocols in which muda, which is waste, is actually the enemy of good management. Muda is the enemy of good management. And pollution, litigation, those are the ultimate forms of muda. So corporate and social performance need not be separated, but they can merge into partnerships with NGOs. So Milton Friedman was wrong. You know, corporations and societies, they have to work together side by side in communities, you know, and, and, and forge partnerships with NGOs, strategic philanthropy, and, and, and other forms of social innovation. And pollution prevention and product stewardship can result and superior financial performance too. It doesn't necessarily mean that you know, in order to uh, create a new way of doing business, you know, that's more environmentally, uh, you know, uh, environmental and uh, health-wise safer, and so on. I mean, to do that, you know, it, it doesn't mean that it, it results in a, a financial uh, ruin. You know, it actually can result in superior financial performance. For example, let's give an example. This is the toxic, uh, I'm sorry, the, the top part of that is not, uh, you can't see it, but I think it's called the Toxic Emissions Act. It was in 1988, and uh, this was an, a law that came, an environmental law, a very uh, uh, important landmark environmental legislation in 1988 that required manufacturers to disclose their use, their storage, their transport, and their disposal of more than 300 toxic chemicals because before that it was kind of done in secret. There wasn't a whole lot of transparency and this caused a lot of environmental problems. So the law was passed to make the whole process of toxic chemicals more transparent. Now you might think they would panic, oh my God, you know, now this is gonna be so costly, you know, we can't do business anymore. Well, that's not true. This became an important new source of information for activists, the media, and third-party analysts to track corporate environmental performance because it became open, no longer a secret. And this provided, for the first time, a metric for corporate and facility managers to track their own firm's performance and benchmark it against their competitors. In other words, everybody had to do it. Uh, it was, you know, so that way they could, they could become a benchmark. If they didn't do it, you could be fined or even put out of business. You know, it was very stiff penalties for violating this law. Okay. And then, uh, well, guess what happened? People didn't go out of business. Profits didn't go down. In fact, 10 years later, toxic emissions in the U.S. was reduced by more than 60%, even as the economy boomed in the 1990s. So, and many developing countries have, have since uh, adopted a similar philosophy of transparency and information disclosure as the basis for environmental policies, which can be implemented at a fraction of the cost of command and control regulations. And some European laws, in fact, stipulate that manufacturers are responsible for the products they create all the way to the end of their useful lives. All the way to the end. In other words, 
Responsibility doesn't just uh, end when you sell a product. You're responsible for that product all the way to the end. And this brings about product stewardship and green design protocols. The life cycle management. This is the core principle that you design the products to take account of their entire life cycle and with the goal of eliminating all waste. So from the sourcing of raw materials and energy from the earth to the reuse, the remanufacture or even return of the earth's materials to the earth, in some cases, yes, but you take responsibility for that whole process. It's a cradle to cradle rather than cradle to grave. And these life cycle design principles actually will yield competitively superior products that will not only reduce environmental footprint, but will lower costs and increase the return on assets. Now, do you ever wonder why products are made to just be thrown away so quickly? That you use them and consume them and then just throw them away and you just pretend that they just go nowhere? But actually they do go somewhere. You know, and the, 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 the idea here is to design products that will last you a whole lifetime. So you never have to throw them away. That you can reuse them or even recycle them. You know, so that there's never any waste because of the design of the product has changed. It's no longer a product that just has a temporary life shelf. It's a product that will last for even a lifetime. That's the idea. So the goal is waste-free products from waste-free factories. That's the goal. Pollution is not only the smell of waste, it's also the smell of poor management. So life cycle management is a way to improve management in the design of products, the green design, product stewardship, and going beyond greening towards sustainability. Because greening by itself falls short of what's possible and needed. Now, of course, it's, it, you know, it slows down the speed. But it, in some ways, it's still heading in the wrong direction because what, what is really needed is a whole transformation in order to reach real sustainability. And that means a new form of natural capitalism. Natural capitalism. And natural capitalism, in other words, is a holistic way of looking at the whole uh, earth in the three economies. The one is the money economy, which of course we're all familiar with the money economy, right? But, um, you know, but did you know that there are two other economies? There's also the uh, traditional economy, you know, which of course, about four million, more than half the world's planet is in the traditional economy. Not everybody is participating in the money economy. The money economy is only like about uh, 800 you know, million people. And, uh, you know, so well, 2 billion, but only 800 million within those that uh, are, are, are within the developed, what's called the developed countries. And the rest of them are what are called the underdeveloped, you know, uh, people like, you know, who are just barely, you know, trying to survive, you know, the, in the rural areas around the globe, um, oftentimes making one to two dollars a day on average. That's about four million people. That's more than half you know, uh, the population of the planet is in the traditional economy. They're not really that integrated into the money economy. Uh, and then uh, another economy besides the money economy and the traditional economy is that of the uh, natural economy. That's nature's economy. That's the economy that everything else is based on. And without that, nothing else. There, there could be no money economy. There could be no traditional economy. It's the biosphere. It's the natural resources and so on. That, uh, the, 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 the renewable and non-renewable resources. So natural capitalism takes all three economies into um, consideration and how they interact with each other and uh, how they can reach sustainability. So it's the difference between co-efficient and co-eco-effective. Eco-efficient, eco-effective. 
The new corporate challenge is to move beyond greening by pursuing new technologies that have the potential to be inherently clean. Inherently clean. And, uh, and also reaching out to bring the benefits of the free market system to the entire human community of 6.5 billion people. Actually, I think it's somewhere close to 7 billion now since this book was written, rather than just the 800 million people at the top of the economic pyramid in the money economy. In other words, we have to bring the benefits. The free market system can help so that everyone can prosper, the whole entire globe. That's the goal. So beyond greening and towards sustainability. And do it in a way that is not environmentally destructive or causes a prob health problems. Uh, and it's just, you know, to the workers, to the laborers. So by moving beyond greening, the corporate challenge is to not only address mounting social and environmental concerns, but also to build a global foundation for innovation and growth in the future. Now, uh, just, just uh, uh, to take a look at, at the past, and we can see how things have been going. Uh, just to take a sort of historical view, the long and winding road, how sustainable global enterprises could simultaneously outperform today's competitors and outrun them in tomorrow's technologies and markets while rapidly moving us towards a sustainable world. So from the uh, 1940s, uh, you know, through the 1960s, it was more or less, you know, the uh, take, make, and waste uh, paradigm, of, uh, that, that, you know, in which you have obligation, you know, uh, you know, you have an obligation to address you know, pollution, but there was still a lot of denial and the smell of money. Uh, so it was kind of, you know, moving from, it was kind of, kind of ignorant and oblivious, you know, basically, to, to the uh, environmental costs, uh, the environmental and health costs of, uh, industries. And then, but the, res and the response was the end of pipe regulation, you know, command and control, the trade-off, you know. You have to pay to reduce the negative impact, you know. But then in the, from the 1970s to the 1990s, been 80s and 90s, began to see the greening revolution took off and we began to see it more as an opportunity, you know, where, you know, pollution could be prevented and even, you know, the, the idea of pollution stewardship and eco-efficiency. Finally, now from the mid-90s to the present, you have this, the, the, a new, another sort of revolution, and it's called reorientation beyond greening, which is basically uh, based on clean technology, reaching out to the base of the pyramid, and, you know, eco-effectiveness. So from win-win to positive force. So, the next sustainability challenge has to do with reaching the base of the pyramid, those, uh, those in the traditional economy, the four billion people, you know, and reaching out to them and make them part of the market economy, but in a way that's, uh, again, you know, not environmentally destructive or presenting health dangers, but, uh, you know, can uh, help people to, uh, you know, uh, participate in the money economy in a healthy way, and that's one that's sustainable. It's the next sustainability challenge to reach to the base of the pyramid, and uh, it's called radical transactiveness. Target the unmet needs at the base of the pyramid, broaden the corporate bandwidth by engaging French stakeholders, and clean technology, you know, to native capability. Deploy the disruptive, sustainable technologies of the future and co-invent contextualized solutions that can leverage local knowledge. You know, through, uh, and this is throughout the globe. In other words, uh, becoming indigenous uh, and getting them involved so that they can participate too in the money economy, but in the way that doesn't destroy their traditional economies, our nature's economy, and to find the right balance. And so in order to achieve global sustainability, you have to, this is a sort of equation that you should be uh, conscious of. That the total environmental impact is a function of three factors. And that is I, environmental impact, equals pollution plus affluence, which is really just a proxy for consumption, times technology. That is how the wealth is created. All of those factors combine to 
create the environmental impact. So, now let's just look at a couple of options, you know, that, that people have tried to uh, bring up um, that are not really such very good options in my opinion. Like some people have said, well, the problem today, you know, the reason why we can't reach global sustainability or the problem with, you know, for example, global climate change is that there's just too many people. You know, the population is just growing too much. So we should decrease population. But doing that, uh, for one thing, would require draconian efforts. And what that means is, you know, you have to take, you have to work within a, like a very authoritarian system, like China did, you know, the one-child policy. I mean, that's a sort of draconian effort to de decrease population. But in reality, population is actually slowing, and it should stabilize between eight to ten million billion people by mid-century. And it's just, in other words, if you reach out to people uh, at the base of the pyramid and, 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 they, and they begin to participate in the, in the, in the money economy more and, and, and they're able to grow and develop more, they, you will see, and this, is, this has always been the case, historically proven, that the population will start to go down. You know, so, the, so the, the, like people in the developed countries, in fact, some of their populations are, are, are even going in a negative direction. You know, so uh, the more developed the country becomes, the less populated, it will go, population will go down naturally. Um, now, another option that's also been, uh, you know, proposed, which I'm not, again, I'm not really that uh, in favor of, is to say, well, this, the problem is this is too, there's just a few people have a lot of money. And if we just were to redistribute that wealth, then, you know, that would solve the problem. But, you know, of course, you know, how would you go about redistributing wealth? You know, that, that would also require some draconian efforts of taking away, you know, uh, people's finances and redistributing to other people. But, it, but even then, would it be effective? I mean, the total wealth of the world's 7 million millionaires is about $25 trillion. Now, you might think, that's a lot of money, $25 trillion, really. But if you divided that... $25 trillion among the world's 4 billion people that live in the traditional economy, it would come out to only $6,000 each, one-time payment. So do you think that $6,000, yeah, that would be great. That would help them in the meantime. But what about a year from now? What about five years from now? Would it really solve the problem of poverty? Probably not. So... Birth rates are inversely correlated with the standard of living and the level of education. You know, population growth and poverty go hand in hand. Um, so it's a kind of simplistic solution. Now, here's another option, though, and I think it's probably a more favorable option would be to change the technology that's used for the production of goods and services. In other words, it's a technological problem. Now, if we are to reach to the base of the pyramid, as I said earlier, then that means, you know, economic activity must increase tenfold to support, let's say, twice the population. And, uh, and at the same time, technology will have to reduce its impact 20-fold, 20 20-fold, 20 merely to keep the environmental impact as it is at current levels. For example, real carbon emissions must be reduced by 80%, while at the same time, simultaneously growing the world economy. So it may be, you know, it, it may seem impossible, but it's not. It just depends on how you look at it. The technology is there. We have to explore some technological solutions that we can still have a sustainable uh, lifestyle and, uh, you know, we may have to change a lot in our lifestyle but we, to make it sustainable, but it's possible. And... Uh, and at the same time, involve everyone. So to achieve global sustainable development, innovation is the name of the game in the 21st century. And there are some recent you know, uh, technological um, uh, endeavors that are, that are uh, making a headway and uh, they're really changing. They, can, they have the potential to change, to be a great game changer. Uh, for example, bio and nanotechnology are creating products and services now at the molecular level. 
So these, you know, when you create products and services at the molecular level, it, this has a great potential to completely eliminate waste and pollution. And biomimicry, which emulates nature's processes to create novel products and services without relying on brute force to hammer out goods from large stocks of virgin raw materials because, you know, uh, the truth of the matter is there's not a whole lot. Those stocks are not large anymore of virgin raw materials. They're running out. So we have to find new ways, new ways to uh, create, not discover resources, but create resources. And biomimicry is one possible way to do that. And then wireless information technology and point of, as well as point of use water treatment, uh, two diff recent uh, innovations that can be applied in remote and small scale settings in the local economies, you know, uh, that uh, eliminates the uh, need for uh, centralized infrastructure and wireline distribution, and both of which are, you know, environmental destructive. And then renewable energy and distributed generation are the keys to confronting carbon emissions and stabilizing climate. Such technologies are instrumental to the billions of the rural poor to reduce and even reverse destructive environmental impacts. So, it appears that we are on a collision course. As I mentioned, there are three economies. The money economy, traditional economy, and nature's economy. Now, actually, I want to begin, we're all familiar with the money economy. In fact, when you, we talk about the economy, you know, in the developed world, that's what we're talking about, is the money economy. And it's almost as if we're not even aware that these other two economies exist. But they do exist. And it's very important to understand how they exist and how they interact with the money economy. If we are to uh, avoid, oh well, not avoid, this collision is going to happen. These worlds are in collision. But we, we, but if we are able to see it as a business opportunity rather than you know a catastrophe, well, okay. So what is the money economy? You know, it's composed of both the developed and emerging economies. Roughly 2 billion people participate, but around, as I mentioned, 800 million are from the wealthy countries of the developed world. And it accounts for more than 75% uh, of the world's energy and resource consumption. It creates the bulk of industrial toxic and consumer waste, and it leaves a very large ecological footprint. That is, the amount of land and resources needed to meet a typical consumer's needs. Now, however... Next to the money economy is the traditional economy, and this is the village-based way of life found in the rural parts of most developing countries. It's roughly 4 billion people that are subsistence-oriented. They're meeting their basic needs directly from nature, and only sparingly do they participate in the money economy. And uh, so these developing countries, in fact, will account for nearly 90% of the growth in the future. Most of it will be in the traditional economy as they move and start to merge more with the money economy. But the money economy is, is causing some severe problems within the traditional economy as well. And that's why it's important to understand where they're coming from, what their needs are, and uh, in order to interact in a way that's healthy. Um, so, you know, life in the traditional economy is becoming increasingly perilous, in part due to the expansion of the money economy. Now, finally, of, of course, uh, and I would say most importantly, is that of nature's economy. Because nature's economy is the basis for, for the other two economies to even exist. Without nature's economy, the other two would be impossible. So what is nature's economy? It's the natural systems and resources that actually support the money and traditional economies, which are embedded. They are embedded in nature's economy. Not abstracted, they're embedded. Uh, so, and what does it mean? Well, there are two kinds of resources. There's renewable and non-renewable. Now, non-renewable resources like oil, metals, and other minerals, you know, these are finite. In other words, there's only so much of them, and eventually one day they will disappear. But actually, that's not so much the problem because uh, we, through technology, we've been able to replace a lot of those non-renewable resources. But um, the renewable resources, on the other hand, like soils, fisheries, forests, these have the capacity to, they can replenish themselves as long as they don't exceed critical thresholds. 
But once they exceed critical thresholds, then they're gone and we can't replace them. And that's why it's important to protect them and keep them from reaching those thresholds. So uh, the greatest threat to sustainability, in fact, is the depletion of renewable resources more than it is non-renewable resources. So the increasing demands of these two economies, the money and the traditional economy, uh, is uh, surpassing the sustainable yields of the ecosystems that support them in nature's economy. So basically they're destroying their own support system. And that's why you, you can't think of the money economy abstracted from nature's economy. Because if you do, you do so at your own peril. Because the biosphere is that which, upon which the money economy exists. Without it, it, it will not exist. Um, so, see the money economies consist of emerging economies, developed economies, and um, so in the money economy what is needed then in order to uh, bring about the, the business opportunity and, and reach uh, global sustainable development is to uh, develop clean products and technology and lower the material and energy consumption lower the consumption rates. This, part of this has to do with changing your way of life, too, you know, and what really matters to you, what's really important to you, perhaps you know, towards a more spiritual lifestyle rather than a materialistic lifestyle, for example. Um, you know, in other words, it has to do with what makes you happy, right? Uh, lowering the material and energy consumption as much as possible to make them sustainable. At the same time, develop clean products and, and technology. Uh, in the traditional economy, it means building the skills of the poor and the dispossessed so that they can participate in the money economy and be uh, productive. They can add something, can contribute to it in a healthy way, in a sustainable way. You know, so in, in, in order to do that, then you have to foster village-based business relationships, not just going and, you know, take their resources and exploit, drive their people off their land and exploit them, their labor, you know, you have to uh, foster village-based relationships, you know, that uh, they can participate and they can grow and prosper as well. And uh, you reduce the pollution as far as nature's economy. You have to reduce the pollution burdens and uh, replenish the depleted resources and ensure the sustainable use of nature's economy. So this is the challenge, but it's also an opportunity for business. It's a business opportunity as well. So uh, that's how I want to close uh, today and uh, to show you that uh, there are new ways of thinking, new ways of looking at things, and that's what it really matters is uh, we have to look at things in a way that's uh, relevant to the 21st century, not the 20th century. And that means the 21st century mind is very different than the 20th century mind. And we'll see things, and we'll see things in, in a new way, with new eyes. Uh, and can meet these challenges and, you know, it means a transformation to a whole new way of life. But uh, at the same time, it, it also means that there's great business opportunities too. Okay, thank you.